Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for coming along to um, Dynamics 201 Retail with Microsoft Dynamics AX 2012. I'm Sue Driscoll from Microsoft and my colleague here is Greg Nikolov from Adaptable Solutions. Right. Uh, so that bear, I'm an AX technical bear for over 10 years. Um, in the rayback thing that uh, seemed to come through on the, the keynote yesterday, uh, my involvement with um, <coughs> Um, computing and stuff been way back for about more than 30 years. I remember um, in, in the early 1980s seeing a Commodore PET for the very first time, programmed in, in Microsoft Basic, and uh, I was totally turned around by that experience. Previous to that, I'd been wanting to do um, archaeology at university, become an archaeologist, and as soon as I saw that, I said, so that, I'm going to do computers. <laughs> the was way more exciting. And uh, moving on from that, um, in the early 1980s, um, not long after that, I was um, working in, with Microsoft uh, Xenix, which was an early Microsoft version of Unix in about 1982, um, and we were programming um, in C using a relational database. So that's um, you know, 30 years ago, that's pretty cutting edge for that time. Um, since that time, I've been involved in and out with Microsoft technologies. Um, I've watched Windows NT come, I've watched uh, it grow up. Um, it's somewhat like a child because it's been around sort of about, um, for me it's been around for about uh, 20 odd years. And uh, yeah, so um, I've been in the ERP space over most of that time as well. So in the last uh, 10 years I started a company called Adaptable Solutions with a business partner and um, we, we focus in the Dynamics AX product. Now initially AX um, was not a Microsoft product, but not long after we started Microsoft bought it. Uh, and since then it's grown in leaps and bounds. So we've, and it's, like Bill Gates said, overestimate the impact of the next two years and underestimate the next 10 years that follows. So, um, and we have a little corollary to that, to, um, to Bill's comment, is that software sticks around for a lot longer than you think. Because I remember the Y2K issue, a lot of it was very old software that should have been retired years ago, but wasn't. Um, as I said there, I've got an original Xbox, I've got it the day it came out. I didn't quite stand in the queue, but pretty near. And I've got a Kinect the same day it came out as well. Unfortunately, I don't get a lot of time to use the Kinect and the Xbox these days, because I'm focusing mainly on my Um But um, I do have, um, I like technology, I do like to have a bit of a play with it. And uh, all my friends know that, so I love coming around my place, because there's always a new gadget for me to show them. Um, whether it be my new Dyson vacuum cleaner or um, my Raspberry Pi, um, little cigarette packet sized um, a media device um, and of course um, I do like a good beer and um, I think um, sometimes my friends come in because I know my fridge is full of beer as well so you know. okay so um, I'm Sue Driscoll from Microsoft I've been with Microsoft for eight years uh, prior to that I was a Gady Edwards consultant um, mostly in Europe where I was involved in doing a sort of worldwide or rather European wide rollout of Gady Edwards to various companies throughout that um, so I, I actually started using computers um, at university I started off doing a science degree and then changed to computer science when I just did it as, as an interest paper when it started coming out and then suddenly I was able to actually do a degree in it which was fantastic. So uh, one of my hobbies is um, online gaming, that's a picture of my main raiding tune in World of Warcraft so um, I've got the saviour of Azeroth which means I've killed heroic madness so if any one of you knows uh, World of Warcraft you'll know what that means and I also love technology so a lot of um, Friends of mine used to come around to my house in the UK and they'd look at my magazines and I'd have T3, which was Tomorrow's Technology Today, and Top Gear. And they said I couldn't have been a normal girl. I must have been a boy in disguise because I just didn't... Where were the girly magazines? I just never, ever had any. I always had boy stuff. And, of course, I'm really looking forward to the new Surface. Have any of you guys seen the video of the Surface? Doesn't it look awesome? And Steve Farmer has said, all Microsoft people are going to get one. Yay! So I'm really happy to be working for Microsoft. Um, for Dynamics AX, I've been doing, um, I'm the ERP specialist at Microsoft, as I mentioned, but Dynamics AX is my specialist subject there, so I learnt it when it was called Exapta um, from the start, and since about two years in, I then became a certified trainer for Dynamics AX, so I've, I've been training on the last three versions, training partners, and I've also delivered the What's New in, in AX 2012, the current release, 
in at least three other countries other than New Zealand. So that's been um, quite a lot of fun. So the topic today is uh, Dynamics AX in retail. Um, how many people here know Dynamics AX? Anyone? Okay, a couple of you. Um, how many of you are in retail? A lot of you in retail are using some sort of retail software. Good, so that's great that you're going to be looking at this. So first of all, we're going to have a look at what Dynamics AX is, just to give you an overview of, of the actual software itself, which retail is a part of. Um, then we're going to look at the actual retail and pause in it. So Dynamics AX comes with a retail module so that um, you have your full enterprise resource planning system which has you know, your finance, your AR, your AP, your manufacturing, HR and also retail in it. So we're going to look at that and more specifically about how you design your pause within Dynamics AX. So Greg will be showing you that. Then the last demo we're going to do is looking at FPOS integration. Now, FPOS is one of the things in New Zealand that everyone seems to do it. You know, the corner dairy does. If you, if you go to one of those um, fairs, you'll find people standing there and they will still take FPOS. I mean, my husband, for example, doesn't carry cash at all. Do you I carry cash? No, I don't carry any cash because I never have any. <laughs> So he uses FPOS everywhere all the time. So New Zealand is one of those, the biggest ones, about biggest uh, countries in the world where people use FPOS instead of cash. And of course, FPOS integration and how we integrate that to our point of sale devices is quite important. So Greg's going to go over how we do that with our Dynamics AX for retail. So a little bit on Microsoft Dynamics AX first. It was released in 1998, so it's about 14 years old now. So it was initially called Damgard Exapter, Damgard being a Danish company that um, created it and they gave it the name Exapter. So you might find some people referring to it as Exapter still. Um, Microsoft acquired this product in 2002 and over time, over this time, there's been nine major releases, the current one being Dynamics AX 2012. So it was, when it was bought, it was Damgard Exapter. Microsoft then called it Microsoft Business Solutions Exapter. And then we did a rebranding of our business solution products into Microsoft Dynamics, which was back in 2004, but it's amazing how many people still call it by the old names. We've got over 12,000 customers worldwide, which is in 32 countries, as you can see here. Um, I've just put a, a few customers up there, and we have over 120 in New Zealand, which, which range in size from three to over 300 users, though I'm actually going to be working on a project that's going live next year that has over 750 users of Dynamics AX. So the Omnicom Group is one of our big customers Abroad, they have about 38,000 uh, employees, not all users of the system, but that's still um, pretty good. Um, Patagonia is a very well known brand, you've probably heard of that, do clothing and stuff like that. And Lotus F1, again, these are just three completely different types of customers. They also use Dynamics AX as a back end. In addition, Microsoft use it, uh, we use it ourselves in our products as well. So our Xbox is actually manufactured, the plant that runs the manufacturing actually uses Dynamics AX to manufacture the Xbox. We also do it to create the DVDs that Windows and Office, for example, come out on. So we use it for production in there. And we've got a couple of other customers uh, from New Zealand there. So Methvin is a company that does tapware. You might have had Methvin in your showers and your bathrooms. Um, they've been using Dynamics AX for a few years, and there's a couple there that are adaptable customers, which I'll just let Greg talk to. Yeah, and um, Bibrac is a, uh, a wholesaler and distributor, as well as a retail arm. Um, they're a customer that um, we're currently implementing with AX and retail, and they're going to be going live with those in October this year. So it's a chain of that, you might know them basically as a chain of outdoor shops, so um, there's three throughout New Zealand. Um, so they're uh, very keen to um, to upgrade the existing retail um, system into um, Dynamics AX with everything that's basically in one box. Um, Wycliffe, it's a company that um, for, you, uh, for people like me who are uh, pretty old, um, old computer people, they would remember boxes of Blanco with Wycliffe logos on the side. Um, Wycliffe is a printing company, but historically um, they've grown up um, quite a lot and now 
that are more into uh, basically distribution and um, basically warehousing, global logistics almost for big New Zealand companies. You've probably interacted with them in ways that you would never think. For instance, if you've ever um, found the ID to order a particular tax form, you've interacted with the um, the Wycliffe um, systems. If you've um, um, uh, a bank, if you basically requested any form from your bank, they would probably come from through Wycliffe. Same with checkbox, they did have a big line of printing checkbox for people. Uh, and also, um, the other way that you would have interacted with them is that if you've got a right of fitness or registration on your car, um, the manager will have as well. With the logistics and distribution of right of fitness um, books in particular, is quite strict. Each uh, one has to be uniquely numbered and controlled. So they have to be able to trace a right um, a round of fitness sticker right back to the actual um, shop at current, you know, the individual round of fitness um, operator issued it and trace it all the way through. So a uh, Wycliffe have everything fully automated. Um, they have about 100 users in AX, but um, the amount of um, automated transaction they put through the system belies that size. It's, it's equivalent of four times the size of that in terms of sheer volume of transactions. So it's huge. Okay, so Microsoft Dynamics AX, um, we've just put a um, PowerPoint up here because you can get these slides afterwards. So this is an example of a role center for a financial person. So you can see we've got some examples here. At the top we have financial activities. So these are like little piles of paper that enable you to actually pop on your desktop that will actually show you how many documents there are and then you can click on the actual pile of paper to drill into them to take you to that form. So this is something that, that Greg will be showing you shortly, how you can actually personalize these cues um, to suit yourself. So rather than going into, you know, looking at every single customer's invoices, just look at your customer's invoices. Over on the right, we've got um, a SQL reporting services chart. Dynamics AX, um, of course, uses a SQL database. All its reports are actually done in SQL reporting services, and it uses SQL analysis services. For, to give us some cubes as well. On the left, underneath the actual cues, you can see we've got a work list. This is where we can get um, alerts for things such as someone's changed a credit limit, someone's changed a bank account, or it could be, can you please approve this purchase requisition? Can you please, you know, all that sort of thing. Workflow information like that can come along into that area. You can see below that there's a sort of KPI chart. So again, you can you can get um, business intelligence on your work, on your role center that enables you to see what's going on in your business. So you can see there they've got some you know actuals, revenues, and expenses, how the trend is going. And over on the right, you can see again it depends what your role is as to what you see on the actual form. That this particular person is interested in the bank accounts and also has reports and links to go out to um, other areas. So now we'll have a quick look around Microsoft Dynamics AX and I'll ask Greg to do this bit. So you can see that okay. Um, so what we have here is a standard um, Microsoft, they call it a demo VPC, stands for Virtual PC. Um, the, this is a completely self-contained um, Dynamics AX system that has, for this particular case, it's got Dynamics AX, it's got all the components it needs, and we've got um, the retail um, product that we're working with well. And you'll see on the right-hand side over here, um, we've got um, three shortcuts for, for three stores. Uh, New York Terminal 1, Seattle Terminal 1, and Seattle Terminal 2. So this is simulating being not only the head office, if you like, for the, week, for the whole uh, organization, it's also saying, well, look, you can pretend to be uh, one of these three, one of these three stores, and basically run the piles of, for, on, you know, as if you're that particular lane at, the, at that particular store. So what we have here is, um, I've got a couple of sessions um, already running here, so we'll just switch to the first one. So, um, just to give you a quick look at, look at uh, Dynamics AX, this is basically the, the um, sort of thing that uh, this particular person is running here. They account um, receivable administrator for Contains Zone, and this is the, uh, basically the, the home page. When you log into AX, he will be presented with this every day. Um, you can customize this, it's based on SharePoint technology. So um, again, it can be customized for him and it can be customized in a shared way so all people in the AR team can see the same data. So what, what um, Arnie's got here, so he's, got, he's got some, some graphs here, a graph that's showing him the, um, the character signal in the past periods, um, information to how much has been on over what periods. 
We've got some things up here called queues, which we're going to talk about uh, a little bit further. And I've uh, further down the page because the um, since the web part is particularly infinitely deep, you can go through and have the page as long as it wants. We've got some alerts here where Arnie set up an alert for a couple of cust for a cust two people customers where the credit limit's been changed and uh, somebody's changed the credit limit and it's triggered the trigger alerts with Arnie to say, hey, um, this customer's credit limit's been changed and that, that may be deliberate or uh, may require want further investigation. So it's just a way of setting things up. So effectively, this becomes a way to manage your uh, organization or the role you, or the role you do by an exception basis. So rather than having to run around and scan everything and make sure the credit limits have been touched, you say get the system set up and run it for you and then that comes and tells you when things are not where they were. Um, so that, that's more like a management by exception. Now in this particular case, um, and he's got um, a QC setup, which is uh, invoices that are overdue. So in this particular case, it's like a, meant to be like a little stack of newspapers, with papers, and the number on there, which is 135 in this case, is how many there are. So it's telling them there's 135 um, invoices that haven't been paid, that should have been paid. So we'll just click on that. And what I will do is I'm going to take the into the main AUX um, client, um, and it will bring up a list of all those customers and you can see the customers. Now, Arnie's particularly worried about a customer called um, Sunset Wholesale. So he wants to have a look at what Sunset Wholesale is doing. So we're going to scroll down the list here, and we're going to find Sunset Wholesale in the list. Here we go. And he's going to f then we're going to filter the list just to that particular customer, 1102. So now we're seeing the list of all the invoices that, that Sunset Wholesale um, um, had outstanding at the moment. And this is where this, this system will remember this filtered view. He can, you can see at the top here, it says, um, customer invoice has passed you on sale filter. And he can, um, easily save it, so he can save it, so he can call it, um, sunset wholesales. So you can then quickly apply that filter anytime he likes. So he can come back here. And you can pick it from a drop down list, so you can reapply that any time you like. Secondly, and the reason why we're, we're other thing is, you can save this as a queue. Now, what that would mean is that we can push it out to the web page that we just saw a bit earlier, so I'll do that now. So there is Sunset Wholesales Overdue Invoices. While you're on that, yep. you notice also you've got the option to show the sum of the field. Oh, yes, so I didn't click on that, Greg. Yeah, very good point, sir. So I forgot that. Um, one of the things, not only can you show how many there are, but you can also show um, what the total of total balance is. In this case, we want to see the, the open amount. We want to see how much money they owe us. Okay, and we're also going to say, well, look, um, we also want, to, want you to flag it up with an error or a particular warning if it's greater than or equal to 10. So, provided these guys owe us, so less than 10 open invoices, so they're reasonably happy. So we just said that. So we'll save that. And so now it's, we've now go back to the home page. Push it up the top. So this home page is based on SharePoint. It actually uses SharePoint as its option. All of these um, areas you can see here are actually SharePoint web parts. And that gives you the flexibility to add anything else that SharePoint can see as well. You actually only need SharePoint Foundation Services, which comes with Windows Server as standard, but you can also get SharePoint Server, which gives you a lot more web parts that you can actually put on your home page. So, for example, if Outlook was something you really wanted to have on your web page in Dynamics AX, you could actually have your inbox or your calendar, for example, showing in there. Okay, so I've refreshed the screen, and you notice it's, autom I didn't have, it's automatically added it to the uh, account receivable activities um, web part at the top there. It's brought in Sunset Wholesales at the end. It has told me there are 21 outstanding here, and it's put a little uh, alert sign there saying, hey, it's greater than the alert limit. So if only comes in tomorrow or any time in the future, um, he can just simply click on that and you will go to this to a filter view showing them all the whole sunset wholesale um, overdue invoices. So from that from that point of view it means you can start managing stuff um, not by exception. The menu that I picked on here um, 
This is the full, the full menu that Alex has. Now you'll notice it's got the accounts receivable, payable, all the things you'd expect in retail right down the bottom. So there's a lot of functionality in AUX, and so therefore in a big organization, there are a lot of people doing different things, so therefore it's important that they be able to um, coordinate their activities. And it also means that um, Pimok Army is probably wearing multiple hats. It's very typical in a company like New Zealand, where you do about 10 things in a day, that's typical what I do. And so what Army will probably like to do is have his homepage customized, so that not only will he have some accounts receivable, he may have accounts payable functionality and things that he needs to monitor as well. So he can completely customize his screen to the way he likes, and there's, there's this homepage. Um, just a, just a, a couple of more things. Uh, AUX itself, for those people that have never used it before, it is basically um, it leverages um, Microsoft SQL Server. It runs on Windows Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, it's 64 bit, uh, except for the clients, which are still 32 bit. Um, so that's sort of the technology stack behind behind AUX. If you're not familiar with. So that was a quick look around um, Dynamics AX, just giving you guys an overview for those of you who haven't seen it before, which is most of you. So now I've just got a question for you, and we were going to give a prize of a Tokoro bar and an adaptable solutions pen. Very exciting. So I know you're all very keen to do this. Okay, can anyone name some of the Microsoft technologies that were shown or mentioned in that demonstration? You, sorry, you're a Microsoft person, you can't answer. SharePoint? SharePoint, absolutely. Yep. SQL Server. SQL Server. Outlook. Outlook, yep. Well, that's Office, isn't it? So. <laughs> yes, that's all part Gosh, of it. Gosh, we have a very attentive audience. I feel guilty just awarding one prize. <laughs> okay, well. We'll get a few pins. Yeah, we'll get some pins. Here we go. Here we go. Hey, come on, it's all the right side of the room. Inside of the room, your challenge. Okay, so yeah, just, yeah, so similar. we had SharePoint Server, as you saw, Windows Server, SQL Server, and of course Microsoft Dynamics. Now that you actually mentioned that, <laughs> very sad indeed. So Greg mentioned earlier how retail in Dynamics AX is, is really, well it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, AX Retail uses all the capabilities of a full ERP system, so warehouse management, importing, distribution, cross-company trading, it all happens here. But because retail is built into it as well, it means we can manage the items, the prices, the stores, the channels, all those things you can see on the screen there, all within Dynamics AX as well. The setup is all done within Dynamics AX and it's then sent out to the stores and to the pulse terminals in those stores as we choose. On a more technical side, this was formerly a partner solution from a company called LS Retail, which Microsoft purchased in 2009, so that was three years ago. It's then been extensively enhanced for Dynamics AX 2009 and 2012 and leverages um, AX to manage things such as the user security, the stores, the pricing, the physical inventory, etc. of it. It also uses um, store and forward architecture. That's correct. Now, one of the things is that um, I think uh, a previous electricity minister explained when there was a large um, power cut in Auckland that New Zealand is a long, stringy country um, in, the, in the mid um, latitudes, which means that things like power outages, communication breakdowns, floods, um, you name it, it's liable to happen. Um, and basically, in a retail um, environment, all of those things can and do happen all the time, from simple little things like the piles crashing, all the way up to the store, it goes offline because um, the guy on the contract you know, down the road just cut the data cable and it's going to be a couple of days before you get up. So, with the Microsoft have um, done with um, AX Retail, is that they've designed what they call a store and forward technology, which means that the data that comes from your office, 
is replicated down to each to a to a centralized um, server that runs on each door. Now, the server is basically just like a PC, um, and then in turn the puzzles then it over, uh, connect to that um, server in the um, in the stores to um, operate and get all the data they need to work from. The pause itself can also have a local database. So for instance, um, if the pause is in an offline, is, is an out of communication range with the um, store server for any reason, and that could be due to um, a hiccup or uh, by design, um, then it can work in offline mode. And what happens is that the changes that are made into the transactions are replicated back up to the store database and then in turn I replicate it back to the head office. So what happens is that the, the head office will push uh, changes down to the store which will then replicate it out to the puzzles if needed and it will also um, ask the stores to send the, 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 the changes back such as transactions and that can be done in real, a semi real time. Okay, so now we're going to go back into Dynamics OX and Greg is going to show us um, how we actually look at designing our polders within Dynamics AX. Right, mix a button. Here we go. Okay, so I'll just flip to the one. Okay, so what I've done here is this this is a, a administrator. The previous guy we saw was Arnie. He's an AI administrator. This is the new system administrator. We're in the retail area inside AI, inside AX, so you can see that there's a lot of things you can do. For right now, what we're going to do is we're going to go and have a look at the screen layout of the pulse. So we just uh, run this function. Now, it, it shows here we've got five different screen layouts that are defined. Um, there are um, two called manager and two called cashier, and both the, the two of them are called wide because they're, from, they're set up for a wide screen. You can see the whole width and height here in terms of the width. So we'll just look at the cashier design for a 1024 by 768 screen. So I'll bring up the design of designer screen on that. Now, um, this particular screen, we, we are going to um, customize the screen and send it down to a pulse. So we'll just. Uh, We'll get that. We'll get that done. So what we're going to do now is um, on the seasonal sports um, menu here, we're going to add um, an item like one of these. If we look at the men's, men's fleece jacket, we're going to do the same for a boys' t-shirt. So to do that, I just right-click properties. I then say what I want it to be, and I want to select the image. We'll scroll in here. So the images are all stored inside the database, so they're all available at the pause as well. So we pick the boys' T-shirt. So I'm going to do that, and I've just um, I've already just saved a bit of time. I've just put the item code in here. 00140 is the the item code for the, the boys' T-shirt. If we can bring it up and have a look, I can scroll through the list here to, just to check. So it is boys' T-shirt. Select that. So that's how I make a button. Now, if I, on a button, there are an awful lot of actions I can do. Product sale is obviously just one of them, and there are a whole lot of things that I can do. For this particular button, we just want it to be a product sale. So, effectively, this is a shortcode button that lets it just say, I want to sell that item. So, we can we can keep the item in, we can scan it as well, but this is just a shortcode item for the cashier. The other thing is, you'll notice that down here, it's got the word check, it's spelt in the American style. We're going to change that. I'm just going to put the red the abbreviation there, check, because it fits nicely on the, the right size font. So I'll just clear the image. So now you can see the word check. I've left it in blue so you can see it's different. Okay, so we'll just do that. So I've made a change. Okay, so what we'll see is this is what the path looks like now. So this is um, what you use a, um, a dinner. Um, so each cashier do that. She, you can see here that she doesn't have the button there. Do to minimise the rest of them so it just shows separately, right? Yeah, that's all right. So uh, this is so Adina is logged in to the to the pause terminal. So this is what, what can happen while she's using AEX. So we're going to um, we're going to log her off that terminal just just for the purposes. We'll go back to AEX and uh, we will send down the. The changes. So now I've made the changes to my pulse, we want to send it out to the store. Now there's no, we don't have to put on a USB stick and run around or anything like that, we just push it out from the office. So we're going to go there to the, the uh, registers. We're going to 
this could be scheduled to happen automatically, so it could happen every week, every day, whatever, whenever you need to make a change. So as you can see here, this distribution schedule is the means by which we send or receive data from the head office, from Dynamics AX, which holds all of it, down to the actual stores and the pulse terminals. So we just create different groups of, of things depending on what we want to do. So if we do a price refresh, we could send that down. If we add new items, send that down, etc. Okay, so we just we just ran that down now. It tells us down the bottom here at 11, 11, 10 that it ran successfully. So that just means I've pushed it out. So all of it's gone, it's gone out to all of the store servers or PCs, and they're going to start. And then it's again available in the pause. So we'll just switch back to the pause here. I'm going to log on as a, a demo now. The, the screen on this thing is designed to be used as like a touch screen, so I could go um, just touch the screen right on the keyboard. But for now, I'll just use the mouse. And a login as a dinger. Now, this particular um, setup on this pause is that you have to put your operator ID in and then your password. You can also configure it to show a list of operators that can log on and then they put their password in. Having separate logins for passwords is a requirement for PCI DSS, which we'll get into in a minute. So um, it is important that each operator have their own logon. So here we go. So you can see straight away, hey, the check button down here has changed. And we'll go into the seasonal sports. And look, there's the best T-shirt. So now I'll click on that, and it's going to ask me well, what color is it. And I say I want to sell a magenta, and we're going to do a small. Okay, so that's going to bring it up. So here we go. So it's now added effectively um, to the sale the best T-shirt magenta small. So one last thing we want to do is we'll put a. Um, I'm going to record a transaction comment. So just to show this is not smoke and mirrors, I'll put a comment. So anyone want to give me a comment that I can put in, about 30 characters? Or... How about you guys on the left? It's yeah, you guys are a bit quiet. This is a cool tool. This is a cool tool. Okay. Thank you, Steph, and I'll give you some chocolate as a thank you for supplying. <laughs> okay. So I'll just put a comment in for that line. We'll, know, we'll show in a minute that they will, will appear up in our weeks, so the transaction. The other one we now want to do is um, we want to actually pay for it. Now, the options on the bottom, um, we're going to look at the card option, and we'll, but just for now, we'll assume the customer is paying cash. So is, this is all customizable, but for the moment, it's basically customer has exact change, or you can key in the amount. So let's say the customer has given us $30, we'll just put in $30. Okay, and then it tells us, hey, you need to give the, the uh, customer, you've got a certain one change, and that will trigger the drawer to open, and then you do the normal and print out a receipt. So by currency, of course, you define what your, your dollars and your coins are. So in a New Zealand one, of course, it would show you don't give any change, or you give 70 cents, not 71, because we don't have one cent coins anymore. True. So. Yeah, for electronic transactions. This is the US database. Sense, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'll go back here. So the next thing is we want to see their transaction. So what I'm going to do is um, automatically you would have this um, automatically set to run, but for now, for the purposes of here, we'll just pull, pull that transaction back. So you can see the one down the bottom, which is the P um, job, is the POS transaction. So by clicking it, Greg's just making it automatically pull yep. from all the different POSs that it is set to pull from. Again, it's your choice of whether it's a group or a particular store or, you know, your choice of how it's all yep. set. Okay, so we'll go into the transaction screen. I'll just sort it by date to get the most recent stuff at the top. And you'll notice there's, there's a few there for the fifth. But the one we're interested in is the one that happened just now. So here we can see the sale here. So if I go, that's the one we just made. And I can go here and see this is a cool tool. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Um, we can also see, for instance, the um, operator that did it. So uh, 00600, that's a demo, that's her, her ID. We know which term it was. We have a whole lot of stuff about receipts. We can also go here and say, look, I want to look at the payment side of it. Bring that up, and we can see that thirty to thirty dollars was ten, and we go back seventy one change. So we can see we can see all that. So we've got full traceability through. We can see the individual items that were sold as well. Remember that an individual sale transaction may have many lines on it, so we may even see the individual products that got to make up that sale.
So what Greg showed you then was that effectively that the store has a local database, the POS can have a local database, and we use the distribution scheduler to pull the design or the information back and forth. So Dynamics AX was the central repository for the everything on the on the actual the POS design, the stores, the setup, the items, the inventory, and everything like that. So imagine if you actually had like a wholesale company or a distribution company and you had a little factory shop on the side. You could be using Dynamics AX to run your whole business, your importing, your distribution, etc., and also run a retail shop for you as well. The great thing about it, of course, with the local databases means that if you lose connections, which happens in New Zealand occasionally <coughs> when we have power cuts, that your polls will still work, which is the important thing. Yes, and the other thing is that you don't have to use this scheme for technology that's built in. If, you, for instance, you just want to run a factory shop out off the back of your warehouse, um, you don't need all that. You don't need that, that sophisticated architecture. It can be pretty as simple as the pulse just runs off the back of the network. And just, just as an aside, another thing you can have if you are really into redundancy is your store local database can also have a backup database. So if anything actually happens to that database, you can actually swift, switch to a backup database so that your transactions can keep going. So there's a lot of redundancy built in should you choose to use it on making sure your customers can, you can actually make a sale for those customers. Where would that backup database typically be on site as well? Yeah, it would be in the store and the store store PC. So I mean, uh, something like the store PC, you well, you want to have mirrored disk and that, that kind of thing because they're critical. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the, well, um, will, will this technology work if you've got a hosted, hosted operation instead of on-premise? Um, AEX itself is not fully cloud, um, sort of cloud what optimized yet, um, is coming. But yes, you can, you can run AEX in a host environment. In actual fact, that's what, um, the WAC, which I mentioned before, this is exactly what they're doing. They, they do not want to run their servers in-house at, um, at, at um, headquarters in Christchurch, partly because it's in a quaky building. Um, and um, so what they've done is they've used a hosting provider called VBridge, which is a Christchurch-based uh, data center, and they have all of their stores in a wide area network communicating back back with that through uh, through a through the comms the comms network. So yes, it does work in a fully hosted environment. The key thing is that the the e pods integration, all that kind of stuff, that happens at the pods or in the store. So you have to be aware of, aware of that. Okay, so we're now going to look at um, credit card and FPOS integration. So one of the things you have to think about, as Greg said, it always happens at the store, and especially in New Zealand where so many people don't carry any cash. What we also have to consider, which is also vitally important, is the PCI DSS requirements, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards, which basically says things like, you can't record credit card detail information and hold it in your system. It's got to be separate. It's got to be able to be held separately to make sure that there's no fraudulent possibility for those ones there. So when you are actually doing FPOS, you've got the choice of doing as, as Greg will, um, you can say the next bit, Greg. You yeah, know, sure. Me. <laughs> um, we, you can do full pause integration. I mean, AX, AX with a retail component is designed that you can process your credit cards through AX and through a central payment processor located you know, um, through AX. When you do that, there are all sorts of PCI DSS rules that come into play. You have to encrypt the card. You've got to use triple Ds. There's a whole lot of encryption you have to use. Um, things you, you can't do, you can't show the, the credit card number in clear text form at any stage. A whole lot of things like that. So, um, for uh, um, New Zealand and Australia, basically, basically, a lot of people put in the two R basket. So what they say is, well, yes, we can do that, but what we want to do is treat the egg pause machine that's actually in the, you know, sitting right next to the pause. We treat it like a black box. We will, we will integrate with it um, on the pause terminal, 
and but alternatively, if you're a small mouth operation, um, you, you, your pros are actually completely standalone and non-integrated. So happy with that. I was in sub the other day. I went and bought a 12, 12 foot long sub, um, 12 inch long sub, not 12 foot long. I mean, I can do that. Um, the 12 inch long sub, pay for it, and um, lo and behold, you do the EPOS transaction, and there's a separate receipt comes out from the EPOS machine, and you get a separate receipt from the cash register. So they're not integrated in any way. The guy basically has to manually key the number, the value of the transaction in, into the pause machine. So that's an example of what well, most people do. Corner Dealer does that now. They have a little cash register, they run out the transaction, what you're buying, and then they put the total amount. Plus, if they get you to do cash out, or let you do cash out, they'll no, we're there on as well. But of course, the danger of that is incorrect keying. I remember years ago getting petrol when they didn't have an integrated F pulse, and it cost me thirty dollars, I think, at the time. Petrol was a lot cheaper back then, and the guy keyed it. Petrol was always cheaper back then. So of thirty onto my credit card, and I didn't notice, and I just, you know, just hit, signed it, and it was like, oh dear, thank you very much. So then you have to then credit it. But it was, you know, that was because they had to do the rekeying and they keyed it incorrectly. So integration yeah. in some way is always better. Yeah. I can tell you a funny story. Um, years ago, um, Duncan and I, we went out for our uh, annual Christmas dinner. We happened to be about three employees. So we went to a local cafe, um, just, the, um, and we spent about $150 on, on a meal. It's okay. The guy that ran up the transaction put it in this $1,500. Okay? The Duncan didn't pick it up because it's easy to miss the cover in a decimal point when you, you know. Anyway, so he signed it off and then suddenly, well, this is $1,500 transaction I just signed off. And of course, the, the guy was authorized to do the transaction but couldn't credit it. So uh, it took Duncan about three days to get them to wind that transaction back because the theoretically the guy that could do it was um, was not there. So we're not sure whether it was a genuine mistake or the guy just wanted to top his balance up by um, pulling another 50 bucks over Christmas. Yeah. So yeah, that, that gives who says, hey, it can happen for all sorts of reasons. So what we're going to do now is um, with AX, we get a full we get a full part of SDK, so we can integrate. Um, we can all the stuff we see at the pod we can integrate. So we're going to move now, and we're actually going to look at an um, example of how to integrate each pod at the pods. Okay, so we've got any um, we've got any coders here in the .NET Hackers? Yeah, right. So stick in, got to have some code, right? And uh, the second session, have you seen any code yet? A little bit, right, okay, we're going to see some more, okay? So, for you guys that aren't, aren't coders, well, um, it might be interesting, so just stay tuned. Don't, don't tune out, there might be some questions. So, what I've got here is, uh, with the standard SDK, they provide a, um, a standard solution which encompasses um, 32 um, projects, which you can see down, down the right-hand side here. So, the one that we're interested in looking at today is the one called EFT. Now, what I've, what I've done is our guys um, at Adaptable have the development guys have customized this, and we've actually got a payment Express terminal that we're using in the office for testing on this, and um, basically we're using Payment Express, but um, we're using it in test mode, which means we get a simulated pin pad come up and we can do transactions in it. So what I'm going to do is I've got some, I've got um, Visual Studio code here now. To integrate with a pod, it's fairly straightforward. There is a single class called ft.cs. It has some methods on it. Um, the one that we're actually capturing is the one called Process Card Payment, which um, um, passes in a couple of um, parameters and what we're going to do with that or what the code we've written does it basically takes that information we square it all away because we are going to need that in terms of the amount of the transaction um, we bring up a little form and then we show the dialogue and then wait, wait for things to happen so what's, we look at the design of that form it's very, it's very simple what we have here is a field that shows us a graphical amount we have a cancel and an authorize button and that little little white box in the corner there that's an ActiveX control which Payment Express provides that you can embed in, embed in your .NET apps. So um, that's not the only method of integration that the Payment Express have. Um, they have an XML interface where you can send a little XML um, message across the, across the network to the central, basically the Epos black box that's sitting in the store, uh, and then they'll give you a response back. Very similar, but it's, so if we look at the, the form code on that, the, the bit where everything happens is on the authorize button click, so let's go and have a look at what happens when you click the button. So what I've got here, it, it's, it's very straightforward what the code does. It simply says, well, look, I'm going to get the, the amount that's in the box, convert it to a number, round it to two decimal places. 
Um, in this particular case, because it's a standalone impulse machine that doesn't have an inbuilt printer, in New Zealand you have to have a receipt printed for every impulse and credit card transaction. So we have to tell the system what printer we're going to use. So in this case it's just hard coded. Now for the purpose of the demo, we don't have a real printer, I don't have an impulse machine, so I am just going to um, put it in, I've got it in um, test mode here, which simulates all that. But in real life you would need a, you would need a printer. Um, the other thing is that um, I use the transaction ID that comes out of um, that comes out of IEX, and the key thing is here, I set my currency to 554. Now that's a payment express um, magic number, if you like, that is used to say it's New Zealand dollars. So there's no reason why you can't do other than New Zealand dollar transactions, provided obviously that your merchant alerts you, um, and you've got an interface that allow that. But in this particular case, we're hard coding it to New Zealand dollars. We allow money purchases and refunds. So if it's a purchase, it's a positive amount, and if it's a refund, then it's a negative amount. But what we have to do, because it's a um, uh, refund, we have to make the amount negative. Ne negative the amount to make it positive and then send it through the machine. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run that. We'll put it in debug mode. So what this is going to do is it's going to start, um, it's going to bring up the POS um, client. Now the POS client is designed to run in full screen mode. Now we're not running it in full screen mode here just because it makes the demo simple, we don't just switch screens. But um, you can, um, the idea is being that you walk up to the POS machine, it is sitting there with this, this uh, log on screen sitting on it, and the operators, cashiers log in and they do the business. Um, they can't restart the PC, things like um, um, you know, getting back to the start bar to, to go do stuff, it's just not um, it's not permitted because it, it it's part of the PTR DSS rules that you don't do those sort of things. So it, it locks it down quite so you can see here a little button just down here. If you've got rights you can restart shut down um, restart or shut down the actual PC that this is running on or exit just move and can exit the post client. So for now we're just going to log back in as a demo. And I'll put a pin number in. So what we're going to do is we'll, we'll sell one of these um, boys t-shirts and we're going to um, pay for it with credit card. So we'll just wait for it to come back up. It's a, because we're, on, we're running it under debug mode, it's a little bit slower than, than it would normally be. Okay, so here we go. So I'm going to go up here. We'll sell a boys t-shirt. Okay, we'll sell the yellow one this time. How about large? Okay. That's $21, $21. Okay, so this time I'm going to press the card button. So what happens is our, 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 it's actually called into our code. We haven't got a break point here and see it yet. It's asking for the amount. Now I can obviously, as a, if we allow, we can let the operator adjust that up. So if you want to let them do an F price, you know, $100 cash out. To me, I need lots of cash. Um, <laughs> you never had cash. That's right. So you know, I used to be two plus transactions on my bank, <laughs> and the problem is I have no cash. So, so when I click authorize, so that's basically stepped into the code. So we can see here that um, we've got the transaction ID that's come from AX. We can see that it said that. So I'll just um, I'll let that code run. And then what it's done here is it's brought up the simulated pin pad. So what we've got here, we've got two two windows. I'll just move them apart. So this is the Payment Express. So effectively, the, the, the window you can hear says the waiting card or the cancel button. That's pretending to be the e-pause pin pad that, that the customer would see. And over here, it's given me some credit cards that I can actually work with. So I'm going to say, fine, we'll pick that card, we'll swipe it through the machine, we'll then put in a pin. Now, it doesn't matter what pin we put in, it works. So and these are just for testing. So it's pretending that I've processed it, come back and says, hey, look, that's accepted. Okay, so what's going to happen is it's then um, continued on and we're going into the next line of code and it's saying what the code does here, this is code we've written, it checks whether the transaction is authorized or not. Authorized means to, to be, um, was it approved and we capture the information like the fact that it was authorized, what the response text we got and some other information like the card type. So I'll just let that run. And what will happen is the pods will come up and tell me, hey, look, that's authorized. It's an MX payment, and you give it a hundred dollars, please. So thank you, so I have hundred dollars. <laughs> okay, so that's that's the transaction completed. So let's do another one. We'll see what happens when it doesn't work.
What do you reckon? I love breaking stuff. Okay, so we'll sell the, sell the boys some. I'm going to give them a white one this time and we'll do a large. Okay, so I'm going to do current this time. Now, if I just go cancel here, it's going to bring me up and say, hey, you cancelled it. So I didn't even get to the pause machine. So I'll do that again. This time I'm going to go authorize. It's going to come through this, so we'll just let that run. Okay, now if I go cancel now, it's going to come back and say the transaction was completely cancelled by the user, as you can do with the new pause machine. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, we're going to swipe this card. And then I'm going to go credit card, and then I'm going to press enter, which means that I'm going to sign the docket. And it's going to come up and say, hey, to the, up, to the operator, the signature OK. So I'm going to say, pretend that the, the guy didn't sign it the same, he's obviously trying to steal stuff. So, uh, so it says signature declined. So, OK, so the pod machine said declined, so let's see what the code does. So the authorized will be false, and it says here, that we get a response text of signature declined and the response, so we just send that through. So what happens is, it comes up on the pause. So, very simple, I and mean, obviously, example of signature declined is one that we triggered, but equally when the transaction gets processed, goes out to the bank, they could say, I'm sorry, that card's expired, or it could well be that it's already below the credit limit, or any number of reasons that why the transaction could be. Um, so I'm going to leave that transaction. I just want to show you something very really quickly. Um, so that's fitted into the, the EPOS integration. But um, we're still running it in debug mode now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this and stop debugging. And what that's going to do is that's going to kill the POS client do that we were running. So but we were, if you remember, we're in the middle of trying to sell that T-shirt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back in and say, well, this simulates a POS, a POS crash, right? a POS machine's crash. So I'm going to log back into Dina. And what you'll see is it picks up the transaction even though it was, the, the, as it was. So it's still sitting in the pod waiting for me to finish it up. So it doesn't matter if a demo is in the middle of a, middle of a huge transaction, power goes out, um, anything like that, it will be stored in the database so when the pods come back up, she can complete the transaction. Is it comfortable to say off roads no, uh, when you've got an open transaction um, you, like this, um, Medina can suspend the transaction. Like, you know, you know, come in if they didn't have it. McDonald's used to have this thing like where you could have like two, two or three people serving customers, and they would each do a transaction suspended, and then you know, someone else could come in and do it. Very similar. And more to the point, in the case of Seattle, Seattle's got two pause lines, Seattle 1 and 2. Medina can be working on pause line, pause line 1, suspend the transaction, and go across the other key to log login, and then finish it up. So example could be that, hey, the EPOS machine on POS 1 just broke. No problem, we'll go to POS 2. Finish up there. So uh, you remember, we logged in as a demo, and there we go, there's that transaction that we were trying to get the, um, the credit card processing for. So what do you reckon about that? That's pretty pretty good. Better what you'd expect, but it's still pretty good. Yeah. So the other one is if a demo tries to log off now, and says, hey, we finish it up. So we'll just go. Let's that. Let's take it through that. Just okay. So this is this is your running outside the debugger, so you can see that we we'll just okay. So it's all okay. Thank you. Transaction done. And then we can log off. He's finished for the day. Hey, right, look at that. Okay, we're done. So. What we learned from that, so you would have seen that basically integration with Dynamics 8 for retail, the integration between the POS and the FPOS terminals is actually pretty easy. You get the EFT.CS code already in there, you just need to have a technical person go in and just decide what sort of transactions, what sort of currencies you're going to do. I mean, if you're at the, an airport, for example, you might say, well, I'll take not just New Zealand dollars, but also US dollars, euros, etc., etc., Australian dollars. Some people use those, all that sort of thing. So it makes it very easy to be PCI DSS compliant, which is very important for retailers in New Zealand. It also works with your local FPOS equipment. So because we're actually designing the screen layout only within Dynamics AX, you can have existing FPOS equipment, you know, different sorts of screens or terminals or have them on bar poles or whatever, and you just set up an AX. I'm using this sort of hardware. So if you are using AX for retail, you don't need to go and buy a whole heap of new hardware for it. It can use your existing FPOS hardware that you've got, as long as it's OPOS compliant. That's the standard there. 
And of course, if the EFPOS supports it, if there is a crash, you haven't lost anything in there. It's yeah. all easily able to be offline and online again. I was actually at I was at the airport a little while ago and I was queuing up for a coffee and the EFPOS went down. And basically, the two guys in front of me had no cash, surprisingly, and they couldn't therefore buy a coffee. But I had cash, so I was okay. But that EFPOS went down and I sat there thinking, you don't have the right equipment, you should be using AX or retail. <laughs> Sad <laughs> true. <laughs> so, to summarise really, um, why you should choose Dynamics AX or retail, as, as I've mentioned before, it uses standard PC and OPOS components. It's got the full back office included, so Dynamics AX allows you to set up your general ledger, your accounts receivable, accounts payable, um, everything, your inventory, your replenishment, that has a master planning module that can actually work out your uh, recommended purchase um, bits and pieces for you. It's got purchase requisitions, requests for quotations, workflow, a whole heap of stuff that a modern ERP or enterprise resource planning system has. It's supported by fantastic partners such as Adaptable Solutions that Greg is um, from. It uses all standard Microsoft technology, so if you already have invested in SQL Server and Visual Studio, uh, Windows Server, SharePoint for example, it just uses those as well to make it easy. You've also seen how easy it was to, to change. We just did a, a very simple change. Greg showed you how we went into a queue and then we created our own personalized queue. And the nice thing about that was it doesn't have to actually be my own personal queue. I can create a queue like that and other people can pop it onto their desktops as well. Or we can create it at a role level. So there's over there's about 40 different role centers as standard in Dynamics AX that are all made up of web parts based on SharePoint. So you can basically, they're, they're basically templates, so you can actually personalize them the way you want for each role in the system. And it's robust and proven in the industry with customers such as Bivouac, um, Icebreaker, and Combined Rural Traders. Those are two more customers who are currently implementing Dynamics AX and Retail. So that's the end of our session. I've just popped up here the next book, the other Dynamics content that's on, which are all in this room here. So the NAV session was earlier today. Um, so the next session after this is um, mobile with Dynamics CRM, but there's all the other Dynamics CRM sessions, very exciting sessions, absolutely, uh, are in this room for the rest of today and tomorrow. Um, just a reminder too, we've just got, we've just put the standard resources up on here. Um, this is the things you can do. You can locate a Dynamics AX partner on Pinpoint, which is our Microsoft partner search area. Uh, contact myself or Greg by email if you have any more questions. And lastly, don't forget to evaluate the session. Okay, thank you. Right. Any questions, anyone?